Well, it's time for our first hot topic on The Breakfast this morning. Good morning to you. If you've just joined us, it's The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa, and it is our Friday Flex edition. Nigeria has lost $100 billion to the Northeast conflict, and that's according to UNICEF. And um, it's obvious that human lives, the loss of human lives is even far greater than the money that Nigeria has lost to this conflict. Since the early 2000s, uh, Nigeria has experienced this conflict. You talk about the Boko Haram, you talk about the, 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 you know, the, the ISWAP, and it's, it's just been very, very critical to uh, a lot of things that we have experienced, especially in that part of the country. And I've been joined by Mohammed Abdullahi, who is a public affairs analyst this morning, to take a look at this. Good morning to you, Mohammed. Yeah, good morning, Nigerians. It's my pleasure to be here. Mohammed, where are you joining us from this morning? Lagos, actually. Lagos. So oh. it's not Kaduna today. Oh, <laughs> you, you, you're not in Kaduna this morning. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, let's start by going down memory lane to how this whole conflict started. Okay, um, there, there are actually <clears throat> many factors to it. There, uh, you know, obviously there, there is a religious phase, there is ethnic phase, and then in some other cases is the natural resources that uh, is actually uh, causing a whole lot of the crisis that is going on. So majorly in my own observations, uh, uh, for, the, for, for someone who have lived in the North for several years and still visit the North regularly for work and pleasure, uh, and leisure, sorry. Um, those are the three spheres, I mean, three challenges or three things that have ravaged the North in the past years. Like I mentioned earlier, religion, um, the natural resources in some areas, and then the ethnic crisis. For instance, if we if we go deep into the northeast, for instance, in Taraba, the Jukum and the Fulanis, it's not actually about the it's not uh, actually about the religion. There is more of the ethnic crisis, the lack of um, uh, tolerance by uh, each of the parties. Uh, again, I will not stand here to like apportion blame to any of the tribes. For me, what I feel is most challenging is the fact that uh, each of the divide have refused to shift their sword, each of the divide have refused to accept each other as uh, brothers and sisters and one family. Uh, so it's, it, it's quite astonishing. And if you come to Kaduna, for instance, uh, Northwest here, uh, some of the challenges have been religion, to be very candid. Uh, in fact, I school in Kaduna, Kaduna Polytechnic, my first degree was in Kaduna Polytechnic, uh, the then governor did a very good job. I mean, McCarthy, mm -hmm. Senator McCarthy did a very good job. In my five years in Kaduna then, there was no single crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, you could see the divide between the Christians and the Muslims. Uh, the Muslims were largely up north, I mean, northern uh, Kaduna north, upwards, while the Christians are largely, you know, situated in southern Kaduna. So, mm -hmm. in fact, when it's 4 p.m., 5 p.m., if you are not a Christian and you are probably in, in, in Kaduna North, you are a bit jittery that you want to go back to your own area. And vice versa. Hello, Mohammed. Hello? Okay, go ahead. If you, if, you go, if you go to Zamfara, where, you know, bandits are currently ravaging, uh, it's, it's more of uh, actually the natural resources there. I mean, uh, areas where you have... Uh, gold and so on and so forth so you know these are how um the challenges have been across the north and uh chiefly among these um, states i mean the bono state we all understand that yes it was a religious um you know misunderstanding that escalated the crisis in the first place i mean muhammad yusuf studying the boko haram telling people that um western education is actually uh not acceptable uh, and then you have some people who bought into that idea, and uh, even though he wasn't, uh, he wasn't. Um, how do I put it now? 
he wasn't violent in his um, initial thought, but because uh, he died in police cells, according to reports, and then his followers began to take revenge from police and security agencies. And before you know what's happening, we refused to manage the crisis at that level, and it escalated to what we have today. And Boko Haram has been designated as one, as, one, as one of the most dangerous terrorist group in the world. So these are the challenges that we have, and these are, these are I, I think, in my own opinion, these are how this um, crisis began to brew across Nigeria. Yeah, you, you just touched on my next question briefly because this this has spawned this conflict has spawned one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. Um, how would you say that the federal government? You said back then they didn't handle it well, but how would you say they, they, in the recent years that the federal government have hand, you know has handled this and the state governors? in the affected areas? How would you say they've, uh, they've handled this crisis and the attendant crisis, conflicts that have come from it? Yes, um, it's, uh, it depends. You know, in my earlier sessions, I, 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 I talked about um, the then governor, Governor McAfee, then of Kaduna State, did a very good job. Seriously, in my five years in Kaduna, there was no single crisis. You know, you have um, the military guys and military barracks stationed everywhere because Kaduna was very volatile then. I was talking, I'm talking about uh, 2004, 2008, mm -hmm. or 2009, yeah. So Kaduna was very volatile, but, you know, you have um, security apparatuses stationed everywhere across Kaduna, whether it's southern Kaduna, whether it's Kaduna North, just everywhere. You know that you, are, you can't just foment trouble. People are there, I mean, there are security agencies to checkmate what you are doing. So um, it actually worked. But again, you know, I think in recent years, uh, with some of the utterances and some of the actions of the immediate past governor in Kaduna, uh, there is a kind of distrust again, particularly from the Southern Kaduna Axis, who felt, um, I can't justify that anyway, but, you know, people from that Axis uh, just, um, felt... No, the, talking about Maram, Malam Nasio Erofai. Um, they felt uh, the, the ex-governor, I mean, the former governor, Nasio Erofai, mm -hmm. neglected that axis and allowed wanton destruction of uh, uh, human lives and properties. So um, there has been not too perfect uh, uh, handling of the situation by whether the federal government and even the state government, because you realize... One of the challenges is actually even the constitution that vested everything uh, with regards to security just on the federal government. So the state government gives these um, uh, excuses to say, you know, we are handicapped. We can't control the police. We can't control the army. We can't control, you know, the security apparatuses. They have to get their clearance from Abuja, even while things are going on in far away, uh, you know, Southern Kaduna or, you know, the villages in, in, in Jos and, you know, the far away areas in Borno and so, so they have their, they have their, they have their excuses and I think um, uh, they are right to some extent, uh, even though they are the chief executive officers of their various states. So, but if you, contemporarily as well, um, kudos must go to the uh, uh, present governor of, um, of Borno State, for instance, what he has been doing. I've been to Borno. In fact, uh, two years ago, I was in Borno. I was in a camp called Bakasi Camp. Mm. Uh, the day I was there, that was the last day the camp was closing, you know. And uh, in fact, I know in the past two, three years, the present governor, Professor Zulum, has done so well in trying to relocate people who were initially in the IDP camps to their, uh, you know, to some of the states, so, sorry, some of the areas where in the past four, five, six, or even more years, nobody did. To, to step. So he's been doing well. He's been distributing palliatives. It's, in fact, it's, it's, it's a normal thing in the state, you know, that they, they are called upon, palliatives are there, monies are being channeled towards making their lives better, and so on and so forth. So in that axis, I mean, I would say kudos to the, uh, to the Bono State government because they, they've done quite well at this, you know, in their own little capacity as a state government uh, compared to what uh, the federal government is doing. But by and large, I feel it's beyond uh, just militarization. I think we need to go more into dialogue. We need to go more into checkmating what are the root causes 
of this conflict. These are the only ways we'll be able to uh, deal decisively and end this conflict. Uh, this conflict uh, in, in 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 time, rather than just militarization, because these people are, for instance, the Boko Haram, they are, they are willing to die. So if you know, uh, and if 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 someone is willing to die for a cause, uh, militarization doesn't really, for me, solve the problem. We need dialogue, and we need to, like I said, checkmate the root causes. And the root causes, whether we want to say it or not, is um, poverty. Is um, lack of exposure, is um, negligence, uh, you know, of some of the duties of government in those areas. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that we really need to have a discourse on beyond just the militarization of uh, trying to solve the problem. Yeah, indeed, we've seen different um, governors come and go with different approaches. And then we've had different times, you know, the military saying that they have defeated Boko Haram or that they have tamed Boko Haram. And then they come out from nowhere as if to say, you're not, you know, you haven't done nothing to me. Uh, we've, we, 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 before the former governor of Benue State left, Autumn, uh, we had him repeatedly f so frustrated you know, on television, crying out and, and calling on the former president, uh, Muhammad Buhari. And, and at some point, he, he made very, very damaging statements, you know. Um, you know, what's your take on this theory? That this has continued because some elites are benefiting from the continuation of these conflicts. Yeah, it is, it's no doubt that uh, there are very many people, perhaps the elites, that are uh, that are benefiting because um, war is not cheap. Actually, it's it's actually very expensive. And like I mentioned earlier, from how and where Boko Haram started, some of the um, um, I mean, some of the artilleries and some of the uh, things they carry around to fight the Nigerian army and the Nigerian state at this present time. It's unimaginable. It's not something that you buy with uh, even a hundred million naira. Some these things are so sophisticated that you need hundreds of millions, if not more, of USDs and hard currencies. So how does this happen? How is this gaining ground? So how are they being able to make? Hello, Mohammed. Um, yeah, see, these are some of the things that we need to checkmate. These are some of the things that we need to trace. For instance, we need to trace a whole lot of the funding of Boko Haram, a lot, a, a lot of the fundings of um, of these bandits and so on and so forth. Uh, this this killer hatsman and so on and so forth. I remember two three years ago in Faraway United Arab Emirates, some Nigerians were mentioned and even apprehended for funding uh, Boko Haram. You know, for funding terrorism in Nigeria. You know, so what are were they apprehended? I know some names uh, where, where Nigerians were kept asking for the names. We're mentioned and banned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Apologies, but, yeah. So, you know, uh, so these are, and we have the federal government then trying to shift the names, those names. You know, so these are some of the things that we need to uh, dissect, we need to look on, uh, look up on, and then, uh, you know, take a decisive uh, decision on how to uh, deal with the situation. So if I if I if I may answer your your question correctly, yes, many elites are you know th these guys have got sponsors within and outside Nigeria, and uh, but it is the root job of government to find out who these people are, and then take the appropriate uh, uh, action. Okay, well the Lake Chad Basin Commission and the African Union Commission, they adopted a regional stabilization strategy. How effective would you say the strategy has been? What do we know about it right now? Uh, um, it's quite a bit strange to me, I must confess. Um, I don't really have, um, what's it called, a whole lot of knowledge about the strategy. But what I know, I know sometimes ago there is the, uh, I mean, uh, whether it's the AU or, or even the ECOWAS that talked about a kind of uh, tracing the funding of um, these um, terrorists, you know, having a kind of collaboration within themselves, within the ECOWAS state, to trace particularly the funding and so on and so forth of uh, uh, the terrorists. Because if you look at it vis a vis very well, uh, terrorism, I mean, even the Boko Haram specifically, is not only affecting Nigeria, it's affecting Nigeria, it's affecting yeah. Chad. And then we have um, uh, information 
saying, you know, these are spillovers from the war in Libya and some other uh, places. So, and in fact, these are some of the fears why people are, are scared of, people are scared of, um, you know, another book out of war in uh, in Niger because these are this is a country that has that has border with more than um, that borders more than about at least five Nigerian states, particularly in the northeastern region, Borno, Adamawa, uh, Taraba, and so on and so forth. So, uh, if you have another conflict there, definitely it it will affect Nigeria the worst because people the refugee crisis will be there, and then are we ready? At this moment, <clears throat> to have at least one or two more millions of people in flo uh, uh, flocking into our own country, are we ready? With all the crises that we have in terms of uh, uh, poverty at the moment, food shortages at the moment, and the skyrocketing cost, uh, skyrocketing cost of everything, are we ready to have that kind of uh, challenge? So you know, uh, these are, these are the questions. And um, yes, uh, whether their strategy is working or not, like I mentioned earlier, is something that I'm not too familiar with. But I know uh, the region, the regional body ECOWAS is working tirelessly, tirelessly to have uh, particularly the funding of uh, the terrorism uh, channels in, 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 in West Africa checkmated so that the, the region can have peace. Well, UNICEF says it has cost us $100 billion. Um, destruction and displacement have set back the development of these states that are involved. I remember particularly... Just Plateau State, um, I witnessed one of the crises there during my final year uh, in the University of Joss. And, uh, you know, Joss used to have the biggest main market on West Africa. And that particular crisis saw the destruction of that market. And when attempts were made to rebuild the market, uh, the market was burnt down again. So that's just an example of the kind of setback that this crisis has, you know, inflicted on some of these states that have been ravaged by the crisis. Um, what do you think that the states can do, even though they do not have, they are not, uh, they are restricted, they have some sort of constraints in terms of the authority, um, but what can they do as states? to shield their people and protect their property, protect their land. They can't just be crying. I mean, they are chief security officers, and they enjoy a security vote, don't they? Yeah, I think it's, it's important that, as, uh, if you allow me to say, as, um, as a government in each state, uh, you know, we, particularly as a governor, uh, you understand that... Uh, you are meant to govern for all, irrespective of uh, whether tribe, religion, and particularly the idea of whether people voted for you or whether a region voted for you or not. So we must start from there. You know, in a, as long, uh, immediately you are voted into power, you become, uh, you know, a servant for all, a servant of all, you know, without um, dissecting which area is, uh, you know, voted for you and which, and which other area didn't vote you in and you start discriminating in that respect. Because we have is is some of the things that you know increases this hate, you know that 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 yeah. that, that now you know becomes what we have as a full blown uh, conflict in our in in our state. So having said that, then it's very important. We must also look at ways of actually amending the constitution. I'm a proponent of state police. I must I must tell you, you know we can't have a central policing policing system just in Abuja. And things are happening in, you know, the remote areas of Jaws, the remote area of far away Bogono. You know what? It, even by even even flight from from what's it called from um, Abuja to Bogono is about two hours or more. So you have then someone must give a directive from Abuja. Come on, it's, it's it doesn't really make sense. Or you have uh, you know commissioner of police who is uh, who doesn't who doesn't understand you know the language in a particular setting. Uh, you know, doesn't understand the language, doesn't understand the culture being head of uh, maybe as a commissioner of police in a particular I think I think it doesn't really make sense, seriously. If we are really bent on fighting these insurgencies, we must make things very local. In fact, up to the level of local government. Yes, we must have the vigilantes, people who understand the terrain, who understand the areas, and empower local government chairmen to do good. 
you know, just recently, sorry for the digression, just recently we see in Ogo State, you know, the, 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 the kind of challenge local, local government chairman goes, uh, they, they, they go through because they try to speak out against the governor. You know, I don't think these are, these are, they are all the three tires of government. And in fact, the local government is the closest to the people. So why are you denying them their funds to carry out projects to affect their own people? So I think these are things we need to, we need to readdress, we need to address, and then we need to take a good decision for the benefit of uh, particularly people in the rural areas. Don't forget, people in the rural areas are far more than people in the cities. You know, so uh, that is why we need to empower the local government. We need to empower the state government in terms of uh, security decisions. We need to have state police to checkmate these things uh, before it gets out of hand. All right. Well, during my intro, I did say that no one knows when this conflict will end. I, uh, no one knows. I don't know if you do know. However, we have a new sheriff in town. What are the um, conflict prevention and resolution mechanisms that you think that President Mohammed uh, um, Ahmed Tinubu uh, should be putting in place? Yes, those, um, those are the things I've mentioned earlier. I think, uh, you know, we, we need to decentralize power. It's very important. We need to decentralize power to carry people along from all regions, from all religion, from all aspects. You know, we, have, we are a multicultural country. So it, it doesn't sit well uh, that you have one part of the country dominating while the other is just like an onlooker, just like a passive citizen. I don't think it sits well. So that's why you mentioned the president earlier. The president, the president did well by making sure that, you know, earlier he, where, when he appointed the service chiefs, you know, each of the Nigerian regions, almost all, if not all, you know, had like a say. So it's like, yes. You know, we all own this country together. So I think that's a good way to start. But it doesn't just uh, stop in appointing, uh, stop by appointing uh, service chiefs. We must go deeper. We must do better. And like I mentioned earlier, my suggestion is the state police. Seriously, I think for me that will to, that will to a large extent reduce some of the challenges and make us act faster. Then, secondly, and most importantly. And I feel is that we need to go into the root of some of this conflict. If it's because of religion, we should understand how to, uh, uh, um, what's it called, uh, you know, deal with that. If it's because of ethnic crisis, like I mentioned in Taraba and some other environments, we understand probably the traditional rulers should be able to handle that and so on and so forth. So getting into the root causes, trying to, you know, reduce poverty, trying to create employment for local people and so on and so forth, will also uh, reduce some of these challenges. Well, thank you, Mohammed. I think we should also add securing our borders and, and not allowing them to be so poor. Yes, very, very as important. We've allowed them to be. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Thank you, Mohammed, for your time and insight on this very crucial topic. Thank you, always. My pleasure. Yeah. Mohammed Abdullahi, public relations analyst, has been my guest on our first hot topic. We'll be back for the second hot topic. We'll be taking a look at thrombosis. What is thrombosis and how do we prevent it? Find out in a moment.